Hi folks, let's talk seam treatments. In the days before the overlocker and the cover stitch, what secret sorcery was used to stop our raiment from unravelling? How did Viking Age people put together their clothing and protect their precious fabric from wear and tear? This video is part of a small series. We're going to go from the very basic seam treatments all the way up to the more unusual and complex ones we have in Viking Age garments. This video we're going to learn the three initial techniques that you need to know to get started assembling your clothing. We're going to look at a run and fell seam, we're going to look at a split fell or flat felled seam and finally a simple seam with binding along the raw edges. These are the most basic ways that you can join two pieces of fabric together and protect the edges from wear and tear. Before we dive in you're going to need to know three of the basic stitches that were used in the Viking Age. You need to know running stitch, back stitch and whip stitch or hemming stitch depending on what you call it. If you haven't learned these yet don't panic, pause the video here and go and check out this one because this will take you through all the techniques and give you a sneak preview of one of the seams that we're going to be learning today. Once you're confident with those stitches we'll move on and start looking at the seam treatments. Come on! There are two elements to any seam. Firstly, joining the fabrics together, and secondly, securing down or protecting these raw edges. Some methods are two in one, but most involve these two separate steps. For the three techniques we're covering today, the joining the fabrics together part is exactly the same. We're going to use the same technique where we take the right sides of the fabric, we put them together, and then we sew a line of straight stitching, leaving our seam allowance. Now, you can use either of two stitches for this. You can use a back stitch, like I've used here. You can see how on this side, the stitches are right up next to each other. And on the back, it overlaps. If you've watched that stitches video, the beginner's guide to the Viking Age stitching, you'll know why that's different. If we look at this one, this is a simple running stitch seam along here. So whichever one of these you start with, the technique is the same. Straight line or curve if it's a curved piece of fabric, obviously, and then leaving these seam allowances to be dealt with in the second step. I usually actually combine the two, back stitch and running stitch, in what's known as a running back stitch, where you sew a few running stitches and then pop a back stitch in every five to ten stitches to add strength. I leave a seam allowance of about 10 centimetres or half an inch. Use that for most of my seams, linen in particular, as linen will fray badly and the edges will need turning under to protect them. When you turn under a half inch seam allowance, you get something that's roughly five to six millimetres wide at the beginning. And that's about the maximum size you'd expect to see in Viking Age clothing. The seams were very, very closely worked. So 10 centimetres or half an inch is a really handy seam allowance to get used to using. If you're sewing with a closely woven or partially felted wool, for example, the seams on this are much, much less prone to fraying. All of these scraps have been cut for about the same time and you can see how much less this piece is frayed compared to the linen. Not having to turn these twice is particularly handy if the wool is thick or heavier as it minimises the bulk in the seams. On these fine walls, I often end up turning them anyway, just because I prefer the finish. But that's up to you. So, once you've got your initial seam sewn up, you're ready to move on to securing down your seam allowance. Now, why is this so important? If you're not the most enthusiastic hand sewist, you may wonder why, after doing your basic construction, you need to put additional time into what is effectively sewing the seam all over again. Sometimes twice. <laughs> Well, the answer there is in the question. You've heard the phrase, a stitch in time saves nine. Well, what you're doing with these next steps is saving yourself a lot of work in the long run. Seam treatments protect these raw edges of the fabric from fraying and from wear as they're being used. 
and with many techniques they actually add an extra line of functional joining stitching to the seam which prevents splitting and tearing. Just show you on this example here. So not only have you got this line of running stitch here binding these two pieces of fabric together but then over here you have the second line that's going down through both pieces of fabric again. So you've got two functional layers of stitching that are holding the fabric together and that gives it an awful lot of strength and resistance. With fabric creation being such a labour intensive endeavour, protecting this valuable commodity was a priority for Viking Age people and their seam treatments and careful craftsmanship are a testament to that. We don't really need our Viking Age clothing to last for years. We'd like it to as reenactors because it's a lot of work making it, but can you imagine how much more that would involve for your daily clothing, the things that you were wearing, using, working in every single day? Stitches were usually small, regular and closely worked, and large and irregular and loose stitching is sometimes seen, but it's very, very rare. Now this here is a little sampler I've quickly made up just to show you visually what it looks like when we're talking about the spacing of stitches. So for wool garments, you'd usually find one to three stitches per centimetre. And that's from here to here. So this range here is between one and three stitches per centimetre. You can see what a difference it makes from here where you're doing one per centimetre. This would be good for a really coarse heavy wool or something that wasn't going to take a lot of force or wear. Up to three stitches per centimetre here. That's roughly what you're aiming for when you're sewing on wool. Silk hems are all the way up here. The yarn used is really, really fine between 0.3 and 0.8 millimetres and the stitching here falls into this range between six and four stitches per centimetre. An average here would be about five. So the stitches are absolutely teeny tiny in comparison to what you'd see on the rougher end for wool. Linen seams, they show the most variation. Again, the thread is very fine between 0.4 and one millimeter, but it's almost as closely stitched as silk with three to five stitches per centimeter. Somewhere in this range is where you want to be aiming for when you're stitching your linen garments. So the first seam that we're going to look at is the basic run and fell seam and it looks when it's finished like this. It's a really handy technique that involves taking the seam allowance either flat or turned under for fabrics that are delicate or prone to flay fraying like this linen as you can see and you turn that under and sew it firmly down to one side of the fabric with whip stitches. These are the whip stitches along the top here. It creates a really neat seam that is very strong as the whip stitching goes through both pieces of fabric. You can see that on the other side there. The way that the fabric is folded over eases stress on the initial line of stitching here. It gives you an extra line of defence. It's really strong, comfortable to wear and keeps your fabric well protected. So what we're going to do to get ready for this is we're going to try this on wool. You can see that one on linen there where it's folded under. The one I'm going to show you today is the version on wool where you don't need to fold it under. So we'll get started with that now. Here we have our initial seam sewn with running stitch as we talked about earlier. What we're going to do now is we're going to give it a press just to help everything settle into place and make for a neater seam at the end. Gurgly iron. Press is sewn first so before you start folding things places. We're just going to give both sides of the seam a nice quick press before we carry on. Once that's done, we're going to open out the seam here. And we're going to press it to one side. On this occasion, we're going this way. It doesn't really matter at this stage. When you're constructing a garment, you'll find that there's a natural way that it wants to go. But in this case, we're just folding to this side and we're giving it another press down to where we want it to be. 
Now it can be helpful at this point to trim out part of the seam that is going to be covered. We're going to trim out this piece here, which is going to be sandwiched in between the two pieces of fabric once we've finished felling. Depending on how much seam allowance you've given yourself, you can take down either a quarter or half of the seam allowance. Just feel what's going to work best for your fabric. You can see there I've taken around half of the seam allowance out. Now if you were going to be doing this in linen or you've got very fine wool and you're folding this, that means that you end up folding back onto your stitch line and you'd sew along there. But in this case, we're just going to be sewing along here so we don't need to do that. If you're trimming, once you've trimmed, give it another press. Turn it over and just make sure that you haven't accidentally pressed a loop of fabric over that line. You want to keep it as tight and close as you can, not pulling on the stitches, otherwise you get stitch line showing there but just so it sits naturally along the fold line my hand's making some very strange noises today i don't know if the microphone will pick that up once you have your seam pressed you can pin that seam allowance into place everything where you want it to be start pinning I'd really recommend doing this as it helps keep the felt even when you're starting off. As you get more experienced, you can fold it as you go for turned felts, but it's particularly important to actually pin if you're not turning the edge under. So it's really easy for it to stretch and move like that as you're pinning. And as you go along, you can find yourself coming over this bit, moving across and not having everything lined up just as you want it. And if that fabric slips a little bit out of alignment as you're sewing, it can leave your fabric pulling oddly and make the garment look a bit strange once it's finished. Over time, it gets easier to judge how it's all laying, but for now, pin. Okay, we pinned into place. I've switched these pins around into the other direction because I'm thinking very clearly when I pin that. When I'm felling and whip stitching, I like to work from right to left. It's just what works best for my hands and is most comfortable for me. You're going to find the best technique for yourself, but this is what works for me. Fix your thread into place. I've hidden the tail inside the fold here, so it's not going to catch on anything. At the end, I'll come back and I'll pop that one in as well. You don't want to leave loose thread tails, not only for aesthetic reasons, but also so you won't catch or pull on the finished seam. Just adds a little bit more strength to have those well tidied away. So what we're going to do now is going to, we're going to whip stitch all the way along here to hold this seam down flat. Keep your stitches as even as you can. Catch just a few threads of the main fabric here. And then come backwards at diagonal up through this so you're catching a little bit more of this thread of this fabric rather at the bottom. With it, I'm just catching a few stitches very carefully and coming back at a diagonal to catch a little more on the top. How much you need to catch will vary depending on your fabric. You want to make sure that you're catching enough so that it won't come loose and fray. With this one I might come back a little bit further and again normally you'd be doing this with thread that as closely matches your final product as possible but for demonstration purposes a high contrast thread is going to work a lot better so that's why we're doing it in bright orange as you're going along just check that you're not getting any tension on one of the other pieces of fabric. Just make sure everything's laying nice and flat and even. That's what you want. 
just whip stitch that whole seam down nicely. As you can see, I've gone for somewhere between one and three, usually about two, two and a half stitches per centimetre, like we discussed earlier. And on the right side, that's what you'll see. You stitch, initial stitch line there, and then your whip stitches. Now they're quite rough and uneven, these ones. <laughs> You take a little bit more time and care trying to get them as even as possible when sewing on an actual garment but this is where using wool from the material itself that you're using if it's wool or linen can be really advantageous because these stitches will be much much less visible and any mistakes less visible as well again as i always say don't panic if you make a mistake if things are looking a little bit rough if you're working with small stitches keeping it regular as you can you're doing a great job okay let's move on to the split fell now the second seam that we're going to have a look at is the split fell or flat fell it's a variation on what we've just done but instead of rolling all the seam allowances over to one side we're going to split it that's your original line of stitching in the middle there. I'm going to split it and fell down each side. This technique is great for shoulders where you want the seams to lay really, really flat and for areas where multiple pieces come together and seams join, like under the arms and where the gorts start. It's a very comfortable seam, but not quite as strong as a simple run and fell. As with the run and fell, the two sides are rolled together and stitched down. With this one, they're split, so there's nothing reinforcing that line of stitching. So that line of stitching has to be particularly strong. This is where it may be handy to use a back stitch or a running back stitch, just to make sure that that seam is particularly strong. You can see on the woolen example, that's what we've got here. We've got a back stitch as our initial line of stitching. What you can also do is use an additional reinforcing stitch after construction. If you've seen my video on herringbone stitch, you've seen these already. You've got two very lovely examples there of seam reinforcing decorative stitches. You can also reinforce it with a bound seam technique if you do find that it comes undone. We'll cover that in part two of this series. You can see an example here where I've used it to reinforce the side seam on this dress. So once again, we're going to press as sewn first. Then we're going to open out the seam. But this time, instead of pressing it all down to one side as we did before, we're going to open it up and split it. I use my fingers just to press it open first. And then just give that seam a really nice press open. Have a look from your right side, make sure you're happy. Now, there's no need to trim the seams this time unless they're particularly uneven. If you've got a very jagged raw edge, for example, you'd want to trim it so that it's nice and even all the way along. Now, if you're working in linen, at this point, you can press the turn into place before pinning. So just use your fingers, press that down into place nicely. Very briefly, just give it a little press before you start pinning. Make sure you're happy. This one's a little bit wonky, but we'll carry on for now. On this woolen example, I'm going to show you one side turned under and the other raw, so you can see the difference in the final seam. Now, if you've got a particularly wide seam allowance here, you may wish to trim it down so that it matches the other side or that it's not too wide once you've finished sewing. 
So I'm going to take this seam allowance down by about half so that we end up with our nice five to six millimeter seam allowance at the end. Now, especially as I said before, if you're doing, if you're not turning, getting this to lay exactly flat can be a bit tricky. So pinning in the middle of your seam first helps even things out. Try not to put any unnecessary tension in the fabric as you pin. When you're working on your initial seam line, it's often helpful to pin downwards instead of sideways as this minimises any lateral pull on the fabric. But with these, unless you've got exceedingly tiny pins and very good eyesight, you're going to want to pin along the seams and just make sure that you're not putting any tension in as you go. So once again, I'm going to whip stitch all the way along. Pop a little knot in at the end, just to keep everything where we want it. Now what you've got there is a seam as you make it on wool. Now, I know this is wool, but we're going to show you the linen version of the split felt up the top here. Now with this one, because you're going to be catching a turned edge, not a raw edge, you can make your stitches an awful lot smaller which you need to on linen anyway, but I'll show you just here how that's going to look. You can just catch a very small amount of both fabrics really. You don't need to do very large stitches when you're working with a turned edge like this. First line there, that's what around three stitches per centimetre looks like. Some linens were sewn up to five stitches per centimetre, so it's a lot smaller and finer stitching. So you can see here, it's around three stitches per centimetre, four stitches per centimetre, up to between five and six stitches per centimetre. It's very, very closely worked on linen. If we turn this over, you can see there as well the difference in how fine that stitching is when you're just catching a few little threads of your base fabric here. And then when you're doing the unfolded version, they're going to be slightly bigger because you've got to catch a little bit more of the fabric and it's just 
for speed's sake you end up catching a little bit more of this base fabric as well. And that is your split or flat felt seam. Final finishing technique that we're going to look at today is really a very basic form of finishing the seam allowances. You need your stitch line as normal and all we're going to do is whip stitch along the raw edges to stop them from fraying so much and keep them nice and neat, protect them from wear. The benefits of this are that no whip stitches can be seen on the outside of the garment as we saw with these other two methods but it has the disadvantage that the seam allowance won't stay laid flat against the body, which may become uncomfortable, and also subjects these edges to more wear. It also doesn't offer the protection of rolling the two seam allowances together, as that first flat fell did, which puts this seam here, again, holding most of the force. You will have this extra line of stitching here if this should fail, However, it's not going to decrease the pressure on these initial stitches the same way a run and fell seam does. It does provide a last line of defence. It's another seam where using a back stitch for the original join is a wise choice. The edges can be bound raw on wool or folded inside themselves as we'll do with this linen. That protects it from the fraying effect. Once again, we're going to give our seams a quick press once we've done the initial line of stitching. Now that's all we need to actually do for this woolen one but because it's quite a wide seam allowance I'm going to trim it down a little bit just so that the final seam won't have quite so much fabric flapping about. So that one's ready to sew so we'll pop it to one side. Now our linen seam is a little bit more complex because what we need to do for this one fold these edges inside themselves so to begin with to make this easier just very quickly I'm going to press it apart slightly what I'm doing now is just folding each side in to the middle Fold down one side first just to give it a slight crease. Then we're going to pop the two together, and there we have the line that we're going to whip stitch along. So I'm going to finish the rest of that and then we'll get started with finishing the seam. Okay, did that off camera because it's exceedingly fiddly, but what we've now got is the two sides of the seam allowance rolled into the middle and ready for whip stitching. So, once you've got your initial stitch in place, you can start taking your clips and pins out. What we're going to do is just whip stitch all the way along this section. Because these stitches aren't going to show on the outside, it doesn't matter if they're slightly uneven, but the more regular you can get them, ideally the better with anything. But work in the way that's most comfortable for you. Secure these edges all the way along. And there we have a single seam with bound edges. Now as you can see it does stick up which is why I don't tend to use it very often because that would annoy me a lot. In most cases one of the first two that we've learnt is preferable however if you're keen to have a seam that has absolutely no whip stitching visible on the other side but still has the strength of a run and fill seam there is a slightly more complex method for this which I'll show you in part two of the seam series which is called a stand-up seam or rolled fell and that achieves the same thing but with a little bit more strength. So we'll look at that next time. What I'm going to go and do now is do exactly the same thing on our raw edged woolen one. 
I'm going to tidy them all up, give them a press and I'll be back to show you what they all look like in a moment. And here we have our finished set of seams. Our run and fell seam here, our split or flat felled seam and our simple seam with bound edges. Let's take a close up look. Here we have run and fell seam on linen with that lovely turned edge there. I find this one the most useful and versatile. It's really strong, comfortable to wear and keeps the fabric really well protected. Here's that same seam on our woolen sample. Then we have our split or flat felled seam. This is the version on linen where it's turned under. And here we have our version on wool. And on this one we've got both here. We've got the one turned under at the top and the one simply felled flat on the bottom. As you can see, it makes this really flat, very unobtrusive seam. It's great for things like shoulders, stuff like that. Very comfortable, but not quite as strong as a simple run and fill. So don't forget to use a back stitch or double up your thread for the initial join. Or you can reinforce these seams in another way if the garment's for heavy use. Finally, a simple seam with a bound edge. Handy if you don't want any whip stitch showing on the outside. It's great for quick repairs on the inside of clothing, things like that. And there is the quick one on wool. Possibly not the best choice for delicate fabrics or seams that will directly touch the body. And we're done. Now you know three of the basic seam treatments from the Viking Age. Thank you so much for watching folks. As always, if you've got any questions or feedback, pop it in the comments or come and find me on Facebook. And look out for part two of this video, which will be coming soon. Don't forget to check out the references section in the description. I've added PDF links there where possible, and you'll also find recommendations for books and websites to help you further your research. Please pop me a like if you found this video helpful. It really helps me to know what's working well for you all. And it makes me do the happy dance. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, lovely folks, and I will see you soon. Bye.